It never fails. The minute I sit down to film on Sunday mornings, the dog starts eating her breakfast in the background. If you're wondering what those crunchy noises are, that's her. Hello everybody, my name is Rachel. Welcome to another reading wrap up. Another fortnightly one in this case, since we're already like two weeks in December. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> My reading has definitely slowed down in December as compared to the madness that was November, um, but I still have a pretty good list of things to talk to you guys about today. And I'm going to start off today by talking about the remaining things that I read in the Lena Krohn Collected Fiction Omnibus that I have here. I finally finished reading this 830 some odd page tome. Um, I didn't read all of this in 2020, but I read a very good chunk of it this year. So today I have have three of the novellas slash novels um, and the excerpts to talk about. I actually don't have that much to say about the excerpts. They're usually like a couple of chapters from various novels that haven't been translated in their entirety. Um, Crone, if you don't know, is a Finnish SFF author. So the only things I really have to talk about today are Doña Quixote and Other Citizens, Gold of Ophir, and The Pelican's New Clothes. We'll start with the one I kind of hated, <laughs> Doña Quixote and Other Citizens. This is actually kind of like a short novella, I think in the edition that I read it in, it was like 60, 70 pages. Um, I have no idea what this story is about. Um, most of Crohn's fiction is it's sometimes described as like a, a tapestry novel or a mosaic story. I don't think they're true tapestry novels. I think that they're basically vignettes stitched into a broader narrative. The chapters are incredibly short, but unlike a tapestry novel, they're not always very strong standalone stories. That's why I have trouble seeing it as tapestry novel or tapestry fiction. But uh, sometimes this style works really well. Like I really enjoyed Crone's style in Datura, which is one of the previous novels I read by her and I talked about that a couple months ago, I think. Unfortunately, Doña Quixote didn't make any sense to me. I have no idea what I read. It, w it didn't hook me. I didn't understand what was going on, so I didn't care, and I just wanted it to be over. Doña Quixote just didn't make any sense. It was too choppy. The individual chapters didn't meld together well enough, and I just didn't care. Like, there was nothing about it that hooked me into paying more attention and wanting to care and really follow the story. As best as I recall, it's some unnamed narrator talking about the strange encounters they have with various people about a city, but mostly a woman named Doña Quixote. And it really seemed like magical realism to me. It was definitely fantasy, but some of the stuff that happened was just so weird and bizarre that you know, a lot of Crohn's fiction is kind of interrogating, like, reality versus illusion. You know, what do we actually perceive? What is the nature of reality? So it, it felt like a Crohn story, like that was thematically her thing, but it, I didn't care. Then I read Gold of Ophir, which I also didn't really love, but this one actually had some plot to it. And it is a character talking about their various interactions with the gold washers, which are a group of people who live in this like mansion they've built called the Tabernacle. And once again, it's a little bit like magical realism in that some very strange, allegorical, fantastical things seem to be happening. Um, it, it on one hand seems like it's in the modern era, but then on the other hand, it feels very historical. Um, I mean, they talk about things that are definitely in the modern world, but at the same time, one of the main characters is an alchemist. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure I understood what this story was really going for either, but there was this definite set of reoccurring characters and the chapters um, really stood on their own a little bit better. Um, they felt less like flash fiction and more like real stories. So this one was, I guess, kind of decent, but I, I still wasn't very interested in it. 
And then the other novel I read is, as far as I know, maybe the only like young adult novel that Lena Crone has written and it's called The Pelican's New Clothes. This one, while there is a complete English translation in this big collection, I don't think that the English version has been published on its own. So I didn't count it separately as read on Goodreads, which is what I usually do for novels and big bind-ups and omnibuses and stuff. Um, so this is about a young boy who He's gone to live in the city with his mother after his parents' divorce. His father back in the country is already remarried and has a young daughter. And I think it's kind of a coming of age story, trying to figure out where this young man thinks he fits in. Um, and he befriends a neighbor in his apartment complex who is, in fact, a pelican who wants to be human. And most people see him as a very odd looking human being, but the the main character, the boy, sees that he is actually a pelican and befriends him and the story progresses from there. It is a very weird scenario. <laughs> um, while I gather that this was supposed to be a story for younger readers, maybe like not adults, but like young adults or something. Um, I'm not sure if I would hand it to children because it just had this very sad feeling about it. Um, yeah. So I actually thought it was pretty good. It stood out stylistically because it wasn't quite the same, the same style as the other novels I've read by Crone. Um, but despite being relatively lucid and straightforward. Um, I didn't really connect to what it was saying, I guess, probably because it just made me feel so sad and I wanted to feel happy while I was reading it. So um, unfortunately, the last couple things I read from this big collection were not my favorites, but I do have very fond memories of reading Tainaron. Um, what's the... yeah, Tainaron, Mail from Another City, and definitely Datura is my favorite out of all these. That's the one I would definitely recommend if you want to try reading something by Lena Crone. Datura is the one I would recommend. So yeah, I think that's it. I could finally shelve this big collection away on my red shelf. Moving on from that, I read The Heroine's Journey by Gail Carriger. This is a non-fiction book from Carriger about, as the title says, The Heroine's Journey, which is kind of the feminine not feminine version, but it is kind of like a feminine, like, er story type um, as compared to the very well-known masculine hero's journey. And yeah, it breaks down what the heroine's journey is, it analyzes um, kind of the, the major components of both the heroine's journey and the hero's journey, and it breaks down a lot of really well-known media and entertainment properties that are really good examples of both of these. And I kind of had absorbed some of this because I knew that a lot of the stuff that I enjoyed reading definitely wasn't the hero's journey. But it was great to read this and finally have a name and some terms to apply to what I already knew that I liked. And as it turns out, the heroine's journey is kind of the, the foundational story type that's used in a lot of genre fiction, including romance. And while it's not very well known, it's, it sells very well, but is frequently bashed by critics. I mean, just think of how the romance genre has been treated it's a little bit sexist. <laughs> so this was a great book to read. Um, this is the first nonfiction work from Carriger, and definitely it has her humor and her style. Um, it's very clear. You'll definitely come away like knowing things and having it broken down into a really good outline for you. I found it a little bit repetitive because of the structure, but and that's not necessarily a bad thing because I actually think that this book would work really well as a textbook. I think this is definitely a topic and a book that a lot of genre readers would be really interested in, um, especially if you are not as drawn to the hero's journey. This is the alternative. Then I continued on with the manga series Oku, The Inner Chambers. I read volume four, which is written and illustrated by Fumi Oshinaga. And I can see now why many people describe this series as a soap opera. 
<laughs> the first couple of volumes were really focused on like changing gender roles and attitudes towards women in power um, in an alternate history in Japan, of course. And I really enjoyed that. And now that the setting is, is done and everything's been established, it's definitely turning into this drama within basically the female shogun's harem. And I am enjoying it, but it's definitely shifting into a, slight, a slightly different gear, I think. I'm definitely going to continue reading this series just for the heck of it. I don't really feel invested enough to buy the volumes, so I'm still dependent on getting as many of these as I can through interlibrary loan, and it's already becoming a little bit difficult, so we'll see how far I manage to get. I felt like some poetry, so I finally got around to The Tradition by Jericho Brown. I originally came across this when I was looking at um, Copper Canyon Press's catalog. I have really liked a bunch of the poetry collections I've read from Copper Canyon. Um, some things by Ursula Le Guin, as well as some translations of Pablo Neruda's poetry that I read this year. And I noticed this one because it had, I think it had just won the National Book Award or some major prize like that. So I finally decided to read it. And it was good, but I will freely admit that my my appreciation of it was really influenced by the way that I had to read it. Um, I got it from Overdrive, but there wasn't a Kindle book, so I ended up having to read it on my phone. And it completely messed up the formatting and like the line lengths of the, the poems and stuff. So I was very frustrated while I was reading it, and I'm sure that was not the best experience. So this is one I might revisit in like a print form someday. Um, a lot of these poems, as I recall, are about um, Brown's relationships. Um, he's gay and he's also a black man and not necessarily accepted by his family for being gay. Um, so it's all about his relationships, his queerness. Um, one of, I mean, a couple of my favorite poems for this, the ones that really stood out were very much about being black in America, being a black man in a society that's very much not accepting of that, being, um, worried about the police and th those poems really struck home for me. The majority of this collection, though, um, maybe just wasn't as topically interesting to me, but I did kind of like the style of, of his poetry, so I would read more by him. I think he actually has a couple of other poetry collections out, and I may have to see if I can get my hands on those as well. Ending on a high note now, I read Back to Back, Slippery Creatures, and The Sugared Game by K.J. Charles. These are the first two books in the Will Darling Adventures trilogy, and they're billed as historical male-male romance. Um, they're set in the post-World War I era in Britain, and there's definitely a pretty steamy male-male romance going on in there, but I would actually classify these books as more like spy thrillers or something, like they're kind of action-adventure spy heavy. Um, it all begins when Will Darling is demobbed after World War I, and he ends up inheriting his uncle's bookshop, and then one day some strange guy comes in and starts demanding that Will hand over the information. And Will has no idea what he's talking about, so he refuses and chucks the man out. And then he ends up getting caught in between the war office and a very dangerous gang, who both want him to hand over some sort of top secret information that apparently his uncle had had, but didn't tell him about. Only he doesn't actually know what it is, so he has to find it before he can decide whether he's going to hand it over or not. And then this very suave, handsome aristocrat named Kim swoops in and offers to assist him and whether he should trust him or not, he does. <laughs> so as you might be able to tell, because I told you this is romance, Kim and Will have a thing for each other. I think the most challenging thing about these books is within this relationship between Kim and Will, like you want them to be good together, you want them to have a relationship, but Kim is a lying bastard. And it's not until you get to the second book that you really understand more of his reasons for what he's done. So while reading the first book, I mean, I enjoyed both of these immensely. I read each of them with, in pretty much a single sitting, and I just wanted more. Like, I can't wait for the third book now. 
But after the first book, I was like legit angry at Kim. And I was like, Will, I'm not sure if you should get into this. Like, just don't forgive him. Just walk out of his life. And then the second book, I was like, oh, but they've got chemistry. <laughs> Uh, there's also like this kind of a low-key lesbian romance happening in the background and I'm living for it because I really like both of those characters and it, it's, it's really great. So this was just so much fun and I really like this combination of like historical setting, the kind of spy war office element. Um, with the the romance uh, part. So yeah, there's gonna be a third book. I think it's coming out next year. I really wish I had it already because it's just like exactly what I want to read right now, which means I may have to start digging more and more into KJ Charles's backlog because I don't know. <laughs> And that is it. Those are all the things that I've read this past two weeks or so. Kind of a mixed bag now that I think about it. Like I was really excited to get through the rest of the, the Lana Crone stories, but none of them were really exciting. But dang, I enjoyed the KJ Charles books. <laughs> so I'll say it was pretty good. Um, so as usual, let me know if you have read any of these or if you want to, leave me your comments down below. Thank you so much for watching and I'll be back to talk to you again soon. And until then, bye.